it'll plan to be taken into June is what I'm looking forward to. All right, um, we come to the epilogue or the appendix of the book of Judges. The last judge, Samson, has died, and now the way that the story is going to be told, it's changed, okay? It ends with two stories that give us a ground-level look at what life is like for the average Israelite during the time period of the judges. So there are two case studies that are going to show us the spiritual condition of Israel. See, gone is the phrase, and Israel again did what was evil in the sight of God. And now, instead, the commentary by the author is going to be this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And now what's interesting about these two stories in chapter 17 to 21 is that these events actually happened sometime around the beginning period of the judges, but he puts it at the end. <laughs> and it's almost as if he is saying, man, you think what we've looked at so far has been bad? Wait till you hear this, because it's really bad. So the reason I want us to see the way he's telling this story is because there are two questions that we have to ask about this story. Can we judge these people and say that what they're all doing is wrong? And if we do judge them, what is the standard that we're using to judge them? See, the reason why we have to ask this question is because the writer doesn't give his judgment. He's just telling these stories as they are. But just because he doesn't give his judgment doesn't mean there isn't any. <laughs> right? Because what's the point? He's wanting to show us what it is like when people throw God's rule off and attempt to be their own king. This is what it's like, in other words, when people do what is right in their own eyes and have no regard for what is right in God's eyes. And the first story, it focuses on a guy named Micah who lives in the hill country of Ephraim. And, <clears throat> well, yeah, again, it's long, so I'll have you, well, it's not too bad. Let's stand, get you one more, get the kids at, at exercise in so they might not be as jumpy. One more opportunity to get the jitteries out. All right. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem of Judah of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be, a, be to me a father and a priest. And I'll give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as priest. 
This is the word of the Lord. Now, we're also going to cover chapter 18, but I'm going to deal with it later in the sermon. So, yeah, you may take your seats. But (laughs) holy cow, in the first five verses of the Bible, seven of the Ten Commandments are broken. I mean, we got what? There's other gods. They make a graven image of God. There's the dishonoring of parents. There's stealing. There's bearing false witness. There's using God's name in vain. And there's coveting that take place. And it all starts with this guy named Micah, which is fascinating because in verse 1, his name is different than it is for the rest of the story. In verse 1, we have an elongated name with the root Yahweh attached to it, okay? So what his name means is, who is like Yahweh? And the answer is no one, right? Because nothing can compare to God. He can't be compared to other gods. But then this is what's interesting in verse 5, that root is dropped from his name for the rest of the story. And the reason why is because Micah doesn't bear and reflect the divine name, Yahweh. So what does he do? Well, (laughs) he steals from his mom, and then he confesses it only after she utters curses upon the one who stole the silver. And what's interesting is that he's neither very good or very bad here. I mean, if he was thoroughly evil, he would not have given the silver back, right? But then if he was truly good, then he would not have stolen the silver in the first place. So what we have here is a person of weak character. What we have here is a person who lacks substance. He's superstitiously shallow. See, he doesn't feel the pang of a guilty conscience over what he does. He returns the silver so that his mom's curse doesn't fall on him. And then, what about his mom? (laughs) Well, instead of shepherding her son's heart to probe, hey, Why did you steal the silver in the first place? What led you to do that? She doesn't do that. Instead of leading him to then confess it to God and then repent and seek his forgiveness, she doesn't do that. Instead, she reverses the curse and blesses him by the Lord, which means she's not looking for real repentance here. And she's not trying to correct her son so that he doesn't continue this kind of behavior in the future. She easily forgives him, as if what he did is not that big of a deal. Newsflash, this is a big deal. 1,100 pieces of silver is a lot of money in these days. And I just want to give you a quick parenting tip here, okay? Free of charge. You can do a lot of damage when you condemn and punish a child out of anger. Okay, But you can also do a lot of damage when you excuse a child's behavior and don't seek to correct it. See, if you don't seek to correct <clears throat> and shepherd the child's heart to understand why they did what they did and then seek to discipline and change that, then what do you do? You train your child to think they're the center of the universe. How? Because they don't suffer consequences. So they're going to grow up to think, I can get away with it. You lead them to think that there aren't any consequences for what they do, and then here's what happened. They, in turn, are going to bring harm to others because they haven't learned the truth that you really do reap what you sow. But I don't want you to miss this. Parenting tip over, okay? Okay. Notice, she dedicates the silver to capital L-O-R-D, Lord, Yahweh, which is a good thing, right? Because what does it show? Well, it shows that she's worshiping Yahweh, but in name only, because what does she do next? (laughs) She tells her son to make an idol and a carved image with the silver, and we're like, what? How in the world can you supposedly worship Yahweh and then make him into an idol? Idol. In other words, she totally disregards the second commandment, doesn't she? Where you shall not make a graven image of God. And I want to evaluate this commandment for a moment because it's 
is pertinent to our story. Why does God not want us to make any images of him? Think about it. Because whatever image we focus is only one aspect of God. So it focuses on one aspect of God, but it conceals all the other aspects of who God is. You see, an image cannot express the full range of God's glory. It confines God to that image. Think of Aaron's golden calf. He made it after God descended on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, when God descends down, there are earthquakes, there is thunder and lightning, there is fire, the whole mountain is trembling, and boulders are being split apart, and the people are scared to death, and they say to Moses, Moses, you speak to us, because if God speaks to us, we'll die. So they send Moses up to go speak with God, and while he's up on top of the mountain meeting with God, what are they doing? They fashioned a golden calf and called it Yahweh. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. Have you ever wondered why it was a calf and not a bull? I mean, a calf is less threatening, isn't it? A calf is more gentle, isn't it? A calf, you can control. See, the golden calf was not who God revealed himself to be. It was who Israel wanted God to be. To make an image of God, in other words, is to pick and choose what you like and don't like about God. It is to create God in the image that you want him to be, not in the image of who he reveals himself to be. And one commentator said this, it's not wanting to submit to God as he is. It's picking and choosing attributes in order to create a God who is palatable to us. And don't we do this when we say things like, I can't believe in that kind of God. I think God's like this. And then we do this with a lot of things in the Bible, right? There may be stories that we don't like in the Bible because today's culture doesn't accept them. So, man, he's too demanding. He's too strict. And he didn't really say that about marriage. He didn't limit it to this. Or he didn't really mean that about gender. And he sure as heck doesn't really care about sexual immorality. Man. And then what else do we do? Well, we, we negate and dismiss anything that we would say is supernatural. Because <laughs> that can't happen because that doesn't line up with science. And there's no rational explanation for that. So that's just a lie. It's a myth. It's not real. Making an image of God reveals something. It reveals an unwillingness to submit to who God is. Who he has revealed himself to be, and it's to turn God into who we want him to be. Which means you can't really have a personal relationship with a God like that. Tim Keller said this, in a personal relationship with a real person, the other one can contradict you and upset you. (laughs) And then when that happens, you have to wrestle through it to deeper intimacy. But when we simply ignore, either intellectually or psychologically, the parts of God we don't like, it means we don't have a God that can never contradict our desires and say no to us. We can never wrestle with him. We never let him make demands on us. We can end up worshiping a much more comfortable God, but also a non-existent one. (laughs) Now, I want you to notice so far with Micah and his mom, both call upon the name of Yahweh, but their relationship to him is shallow and it lacks substance. But there's still more craziness that happens, okay? Not only does Micah's mom show her gratitude to God by breaking the second commandment, 
But she's also a dishonest hypocrite. See, look at verse 3. She dedicated the silver to the Lord. But then in verse 4, she only gave 200 in pieces. Which means she held back 900 pieces for herself. <laughs> she dedicated all of the silver to the Lord, but only gave him a little. And we do this all the time, don't we? God, I'll give you this aspect of my life, but not this one. I'm going to hold that one back. Or God, I'll obey you here, but I don't want to obey you here because, yeah, I want to hold on and enjoy that sin. Yes, Jesus is Lord, but don't we really live like we're Lord? Yeah, we may live for him on Sunday, but don't we really live for ourselves the rest of the week? See, it's easy to talk like a Christian using spiritual language, but it can be a hollow, shallow relationship with God because you're simply going through the motions without any heartfelt love for God. Boy, Cal, there's a lot going on here, right? And we haven't even got to verse 5 yet. Look at verse 5. What does Micah do? He takes the idols, he puts them in a shrine in his home, and then he appoints his son as the priest. <laughs> and this is wrong on so many levels. Holy cow. First of all, where does God's presence dwell in this time period? In the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is located in Shiloh, and, which is just a few miles from Micah's house. Okay, Israel was only allowed to worship God at the tabernacle. And the worship of God in the tabernacle has specific instructions that they had to follow, that the priest had to specifically do, that the worshiper had to do just to enter into God's presence, and they involve sacrifices. So what's happening here? Micah is setting up a rival shrine, and he's worshiping God the way he wants to, not the way God has instructed him to worship him at. Which on one level, it doesn't seem like a bad idea, right? I mean, man, I can worship God whenever I want, right in my own home. But it's worshiping God in a way that he is not prescribed. And then who were the only ones who were supposed to serve as priests? The Levites. Right? Only the Levites. So Micah appoints his son to serve as priest is in direct violation to the word of God. So in five verses, what do we see with Micah and his family? Answer, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Again, I quote Tim Keller. He says, fundamentally, the faith of God's people is a revealed faith. God reveals himself in his word. We do not discover God through our reason or experience. God says, worship me as I am, not as who you want me to be. And worship me as my heart directs, not as your heart suggests. So what's the point of the story? Left to ourselves without a king to lead us. We will always do what is right in our own eyes. We will always distort God into the image that we want him to be. And then we're going to pick and choose what laws we want to follow and which ones we don't. In other words, what do we do? <laughs> we will always create our own religion. A self-made religion based on our terms and our preferences, not one based on the revealed truth of God and his will revealed in his word. See, this is what it looks like when a society does what it sees fit, not what God sees fit. And then this next scene gives us a little bit more insight in verses 7 through 13, we're introduced to an unnamed young man from Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah who was a Levite. And the first question we got to ask about this young man is, why, why did he leave Bethlehem where he was supposed to serve as priest? 
Why did he leave Bethlehem to sojourn in Ephraim? And I want you to keep that question in the back of your mind. See, while he's in Ephraim, what happens? He comes upon Micah's house. When Micah discovers that he's a Levite, he says, oh, man, I will pay you. I will provide everything you need. Come and serve as my priest. And in verse 13, we see his motivation, don't we? But doesn't this also reveal that he knows that only Levites were supposed to serve as priests? Because what does he say? Now I know that the Lord's going to bless me. Why? Because I've got a Levite as priest. <laughs> so do you see what Micah's after here? Now that I have a Levite as priest, God's going to prosper me and bless me. So what's he doing? He's using the Levite to get from God what he wants, which is what? Prosperity and blessing. He's trying to control God. He's trying to leverage God to give him what he wants. And one commentator said this, the purpose of his religious efforts is to get access to God so that he can get God to do what he wants. The goal of true faith is to give God access to your heart so that he can get you to do what he wants. Religion's true purpose is to get God to serve you. gospel face purpose is to get your heart to serve him. Self-made religion, in other words, always reduces God to someone who we can control. And it fails to see that God's the one in control. And we must submit to him. See, when we reduce the glory of who God is, we're worshiping a God who can't really help. We're worshiping a God who can't really save. We're worshiping a God who can't really bless. And sadly, Micah's about to discover this truth. Now, chapter 18 is going to focus on three people. It's going to focus on the tribe of Dan. It's going to focus on Micah, and it's going to focus on this unnamed Levite. And what's interesting is that chapter 7 prepares us for chapter 18. And the reason why is because the tribe of Dan and the Levite are just like Micah. <laughs> so the first question we have to ask, if you look at verse 1, is why are the Danites still homeless? Well, remember, this happens back earlier in the period of Judges. Right In chapter 1, while all the other tribes partially fulfilled God's command to drive all the ites out, the tribe of Dan failed to trust God and was driven out of their allotted part of the land by the Amorites. So they were forced to live a semi-nomadic life living in the mountains. So now they're in search for a place to settle down a place where they can plant and grow crops and then survive. And what's absolutely fascinating about what, what unfolds here is that this is an anti-conquest account, which means it's a parody of the original conquest under Joshua. This is an anti-conquest. See what's happening. Notice how it all starts in verse 2. The Danites, they send out men to spy the land. And to assess the situation. And these five men, they come up upon Micah's house. And while they're outside, they recognize the voice of the young man serving as priest. Which means they know him then. Okay? Or it could just simply be they're from South Israel. And they have an accent. <laughs> I don't know. But I want you to notice what they request of him. They request of him to inquire of God. Elohim, not Yahweh, not the covenant name of God. Whether their journey is going to be successful or not. So think about it. All right, here they are. <laughs> They're asking this idolatrous priest who's serving in an idolatrous rival shrine, right? And they want to know whether they're going to be successful or not. And then this idolatrous priest tells them what? Go in peace. For the journey you are on is under the eye of God. That's pretty general, isn't it? <laughs> That's pretty general, not very specific. So what do they do? They re they're relying and trusting on an idolatrous priest 
who tells them what they want to hear, and they believe him. And then in verses 7 through 10, they spy out the land of Laish, <laughs> which is outside of the promised land to the north. And what do they discover? They discover a peaceful, unsuspecting people who are very vulnerable. The spies, they go back to their brothers, they give this report, believing that God's with them and he will bless them with victory. And then in verses 11 through 20, the Danites, they send 600 armed men on their way to Leash and they come upon Micah's house and the five spies steal Micah's idols, the ephod and his shrine. <laughs> and the Levite tries to stop them but they persuade him to join them and be their priest. So seeing that this would be more beneficial to him, the Levite goes with them. And then in verses 21 through 26, Micah finds out about it. He grabs some of his neighbors, and he tries to run and stop these 600 armed men. And when he gets to the back of the caravan, he starts shouting at these guys, and they're like, are you crazy? Shut up. Because if guys up in the front hear you, they're going to turn around and kill you. And then here's what happens. Listen to what he says in verse 24. You take my gods that I have made and the priest and you go away. What do I have left? You've taken everything. I have nothing and then in verse 26, Micah realizes the Danites are too strong, so he returns home and his world comes crashing down. And then in verses 27 through 31, the Danites, they go up to Laish. They kill everybody there with the edge of the sword. They burn everything down to the ground. They rebuild and rename the city Dan. And they establish Micah's idolatrous shrine in direct opposition to the tabernacle at Shiloh. And the Levites served as their priests. Now look at verse 30. <laughs> Holy cow. We find out the young Levite's name. It's Jonathan, the son of Gershom, who's the son of Moses. <laughs> Moses is this Levite's grandfather, I mean, this is crazy land, is it not? And that's the point. That's the point of this story. This is what it is like when people have no regard for what is right in God's eyes and are only cared and concerned about what is right in their own eyes. And everyone in this story is self-serving, aren't they? <laughs> They're all opportunists seeking to gain an advantage for themselves. Nobody cares about the good of others. Everyone is using others for their own benefits. Everyone is falsely worshiping a God of their own making. God, the Levite, he's only two generations removed from Moses. You see how quickly the faith can be lost when it's not passed on to your children? You're not going to remember this, but in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, after Joshua died, we are told that there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. One commentator said, one generation knows the gospel, the next generation assumes it, and the third one loses it. See, what's going on? Jonathan is searching for greener pasture, is he not? The grass is going to be greener over here. He compromises everything except his own interests. So he doesn't really serve God and God's people. He's serving himself. And did you notice how with each little venture, he gets further and further away from God? Right? He starts as a Levite from the town of Bethlehem, which is near Shiloh, where the tabernacle is, where God's presence is. And then he leaves the tribe of Judah, the land of Judah, which is the foremost tribe. And then he moves to the hill country in Ephraim. And what does he do there? He serves an idolatrous shrine 
in direct opposition to the tabernacle at Shiloh. And he ends up outside the promised land with a tribe that is cut off from God. What about the people from the tribe of Dan? Well, they didn't obey, depend, or trust on God when they first entered the promised lands. And so the Amorites drove them out. And they too are looking for greener pastures. They bully Micah, steal his idols, they seduce his priests. The weak tribe that couldn't defeat the Amorites wipes out a defenseless town and all of their peaceful, unthreatening people. And they too worship a God of their own making. Now, we've already dealt with Micah, but I want to draw your attention to chapter 18, verses 21 through 26, because this is what God wants us to learn about worshiping idols. See, everything Micah has established, his false idols, his shrine of false worship, the false priestly ephod, and the false Levite priests were all things that he was looking to for blessing. But these false saviors that he trusted in are now all gone. He has nothing left. He lost everything. So what do we learn? In the end, self-made religion will always disappoint. Whatever we make into our God, whatever we look to to bless us, whatever we look to save us apart from the true God can't bless us can't save us, can't deliver us. Idols can only take. The, <laughs> the one who stole his mother's silver has had all of his idols stolen from him. Everything he hoped in was taken away from him and his world came crashing down. This is why we need a king. Because we need to be saved from ourselves. You see, the assumption and the polemic of the book of Judges is that if Israel had a godly, humble king filled with the Holy Spirit, that things would have been different. This king would stop all the false worship of God and establish the true worship of God. This king would have helped lead the people of God to God's word, where God reveals the reality of who he is. Knowing who God reveals himself to be would have helped prevent people from making God into the image that they want him to be. The king would have organized the priests to follow the way God instructs people to worship him, to lead and serve the people to worship God in the way that God prescribes, but revealed where? In his word. This king would display the grace and the mercy of God and how he leads his people so that his people would see that God wants to dwell with them that through the sacrifices at the tabernacle, God's sinful people can return to him. And when they do, they will find and experience the reality of his forgiveness, the reality of his pardon, the reality of his peace. And when they experience God's grace and forgiveness, they would then display grace and forgiveness for one another. See, when God's sinful people are reconciled and made right with God, they will seek to be reconciled and made right with each other. They will humble themselves and love others by seeking the good of others above their own. But here's the question. What king can do that? What king is powerful enough to change our hearts? What king is strong enough to deliver us from our enslavement to our sin and ourselves? 
What king is radiant enough to make us willing to bow the knee and submit to him? What king can display the full image of God's glory? What king can actually live and display the truth that God is a God of grace and mercy? What king would display God by setting aside his interests for your interests? What kind of king, in other words, can prove that God is the only king worthy of our worship? And you all know the Sunday school answer, only King Jesus. The one who left his throne in heaven to become like us, to be with us. The one who did not grasp for greatness, but gave up his greatness for your good. The one who we are told is full of grace and truth. The one who lived for his Father's glory by living for our good. The one who went to the cross to take everything that is bad about us so that he could give us everything that is good about him. May it be said of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, that in their days, they followed King Jesus and everyone did what was right in God's eyes. But when we don't, they would quickly return to the God of grace and mercy and repent of their sin and then display to others the same grace and mercy that they have received from God. Amen. Amen.